So now we're going to go ahead and start getting into the basics of supply and demand in Chapter 3. In this particular video segment, we're going to concentrate on the demand side of things. Before we go too far, I want to draw a distinction between the three concepts on this slide. The price of something, the value of something, and the cost of something. The price of something is pretty obvious. That's what actually happens in a transaction, how much money actually changes hands. The value of something is a little bit trickier. It's not directly observable like the price would be. So when we talk about the value, we're talking about the buyer's estimate of the benefit of their purchase. And that might be a psychological benefit in terms of a consumer purchase, or it might be something like, if I hire this worker, they're going to produce a certain amount of widgets for me, and that will I can sell those widgets for a certain amount of money. We usually measure value through the idea of willingness to pay. So because we can't directly observe how much psychological benefit someone gets from a purchase, we can get an idea of how much it matters to them or how valuable it is to them by looking at how much they're willing to pay. What is the maximum price they're willing to pay? So we could start with a really high price and notice that someone is not willing to pay that price and gradually bring the price down. And once the person becomes willing to buy, then that's a signal of how much they value it. Likewise, we could start with a low price and gradually raise that price. And when someone finally stops being willing to pay and being willing to buy, that's our estimate of someone's willing to pay, willingness to pay. And I'll often abbreviate this in the next slides as WTP. Notice that different people could have different levels of willingness to pay because they have different tastes or because they have different incomes. Generally, we think that with higher incomes, people have a higher willingness to pay because essentially the money is not as scarce for them, so they're more willing to pay it. A third concept is the idea of cost. Now, often we use the word cost as a synonym for price, but in this lecture and throughout much of the class, we're going to go ahead and think about cost as the cost that a seller incurs to supply something. That could be direct monetary costs because a firm bought some sort of shirt from another firm and they have a certain cost to stock it on their shelf and that's the retailer's estimate of cost. But it could also be something like how psychologically painful is it to go to a certain job? And if it's really psychologically painful to go to a certain job, that job would have a high seller cost. Notice in that case, it's the worker who's a seller. A job where the boss was more pleasant and you like your co-workers and the work is interesting, you would have a lower cost to supply your labor to that job. So again, seller costs are subjective as well and not directly observable. How we measure that is a very similar method to how we use willingness to pay to measure value. We think about what's sometimes called a reservation price. And you notice that on something like eBay, they use a similar concept here. How high must the price get before the, willing, the seller is willing to sell? So it's a kind of minimum price that the seller has to get before they were willing to sell at all. So if the price is higher than the seller cost or the reservation price, the seller is willing to sell. If the price is lower than the seller's cost or lower than their reservation price, the seller is not willing to sell. So I'm going to build a really simple example of demand here. And we're going to think about a bunch of people who are potential buyers for concert tickets. And each potential buyer can either buy zero tickets if the price is above their willingness to pay, or they're willing to buy one ticket if the price is below their willingness to pay. And I'm going to say we have five potential buyers here, and they each have different willingnesses to pay. 
And again, that might be because they have different preferences. Some of these people are really big fans of the band. So Apple might be a really big fan and Allison is kind of lukewarm or it might be because of differences in income. Maybe Apple simply has a lot more resources, so she's willing to pay a lot more than Allison is. And so our first basic question here is, if tickets are being offered for a price of $33, how many buyers are willing to purchase a ticket? And remember, the idea here is, if the price is above someone's willingness to pay, they're not willing to pay that price, and they don't buy. If the price is below someone's willingness to pay, or equals someone's willingness to pay, then they are willing to buy. If we go ahead and thought about a bunch of different potential prices, we could assemble something we call a demand schedule. And a demand schedule is a table showing the relationship between the price and the quantity of tickets demanded, or the number of tickets demanded. So if we had a price of 71, that's higher than all five of our potential buyers' willingnesses to pay. So the quantity of tickets demanded would be zero. At a price of 70, we've gotten down to Apple's willingness to pay of 70. So she's just barely willing to pay 70. She's willing to become a buyer. So quantity demanded is one. Further price declines don't trigger any increase in quantity demanded until we get down to $60, which was Dennis's willingness to pay. So now, if price goes from 70 to 60, we have two willing buyers, and so on and so forth down here, all the way till we get down to 30, at which point we have five willing buyers, and further price declines, at least in this simple market, don't trigger any expansion in the quantity demanded. We can draw a picture of that. We can start graphing some data points. At a high price, looks like maybe 77, we have quantity demanded as zero. So quantity is on the horizontal axis, price is on the vertical axis. Once price declined below 70, then quantity demanded increases to one. Once it declines below 60, quantity demanded increases to two, and so on and so forth. If we were really drawing this carefully, it would be a kind of step function that there would be a vertical segment here. So quantity demanded would be zero for all prices above 70. And then once we hit 70, quantity demanded would jump out to one. Then further price declines would go ahead and not trigger any additional increase in demand until we got to 60. Then quantity demanded would jump out to two and so on and so forth. And notice Contrary to what you've seen in other classes and all the math that you've done up till now in your life, we're treating the value on the vertical axis, the y-axis, as the independent variable, which determines the variable on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, which is quantity demanded. Sometimes we'll want to treat quantity as the independent variable, which determines price, but for now, for most of this chapter, we're going to say that price determines quantity demanded. The next concept when we're dealing with demand is the idea of consumer surplus. And this is really sort of a, a shortened version of the idea of consumer surplus value. It's kind of like the profit on a transaction that a consumer earns. Notice, though, that we're sort of talking about a kind of psychological profit, not an actual monetary profit. So the way we measure consumer surplus, the psychological net benefit a consumer gets from their purchase is the amount that someone values the good minus what they pay for it. The amount that someone values the good is measured by their willingness to pay. And the price paid, of course, is what they actually paid. So, consumer surplus, we could equivalently say, consumer surplus is willingness to pay minus the price paid. Now, if we go back to this earlier graph, what we would see here is that the height of the demand curve at quantity equals one would be $70, because that was the willingness to pay of our highest willingness to pay consumer. The height of the demand curve 
at quantity two would be $60. So notice the height of the demand curve at each point gives us the value that that consumer places on that particular unit of the good. Likewise, our third consumer doesn't come into the market until the price declines to 50. So we go ahead and would see that the demand curve has a height of 50 at this point, and so on and so forth there. The price would be a line that we would draw this way. So if we want to do things graphically with a nice smooth curve, we can think about consumer surplus being the area below the demand curve, because below the demand curve corresponds to the height is the willingness to pay, the amount the buyer values the good, and above the price, because that corresponds to subtracting off the price paid. So for an individual purchase, the way you want to think about it is consumer surplus is willingness to pay minus the price paid. If we're thinking about the market as a whole, then the consumer surplus and the market as a whole is the area below the demand curve and above the price. And so our review question would be something like, if tickets sell for $52, what is consumer surplus on the market as a whole? I'm going to go ahead and go back a couple of slides and do a slightly different version of that. So if consumer surplus were $61, our only willing buyer would be Apple. And if Apple buys a ticket for $61, her consumer surplus is 70, her willingness to pay, how much she valued it, minus 61, which is the price she paid. So her consumer surplus from her purchase would be $9. And again, this is sort of like her profit on the transaction. That $9 is a sort of psychological profit. It measures her subjective benefit. She doesn't actually have $9 more in her pocket. In fact, of course, of course, she just spent $61. If the price were something like $58, what would consumer surplus in the market as a whole be? Well, Apple would be a willing buyer because she values the goods at $60. She's allowed to buy them at 58, and so her consumer surplus would be 70 minus 58, or $12. And at a price of 58, Dennis is also a willing buyer. So he would buy, and his consumer surplus would be $60 minus 58, or $2. So for the market as a whole, we would have consumer surplus of $2 for Dennis plus $12 for Apple, so $14 in total. Notice all the other consumers, Alice and Brittany and Cody, are not willing buyers because $58 is higher than their willingness to pay. So the demand curve illustrates the relationship between the price of a good and the amount that people want to buy. And as long as the only thing that's changing is the price of the good, then what we're going to do is we're going to move back and forth along this fixed demand curve. But that would be really boring and unrealistic to think that nothing else ever changes. So the whole demand curve can shift if something else changes. An obvious one would be if we have more potential customers, due to population growth or immigration or something like that, then we're going to have a larger quantity demanded at every price. If consumers have higher incomes, they're generally going to buy more. There's actually some exceptions to that rule. There are what we call inferior goods. And inferior goods are ones where people buy less when they have higher incomes. And you might think about something like, well, as your income goes from $10,000 to $20,000 per year, you might be more likely to buy a Honda Civic, say. And maybe that's true as your income goes from $20,000 to $30,000 a year also. But then maybe as your income goes from $30,000 to $40,000 a year or $40,000 to $50,000 a year, 
you become less likely to buy a Honda Civic because you're going to buy some other larger car. So for people in that example, the Honda Civic is a normal good below $30,000 a year in income, but it becomes an inferior good at higher levels of income. So there's lots and lots of cases there where goods are normal for people at one level of income and inferior for people at another level of income. Overall, when we say a good is an inferior good or a normal good, we sort of mean for the population on average. This kind of thing is actually also common with something like food. So really basic foodstuffs like dried rice and beans, people actually buy less of those things as their income goes up because they're buying more meat and less basic foodstuffs or they're going out to eat or something like that. Another example out there is the issue of what we call substitute goods. So two goods are substitutes if they serve a similar need. And you might look at something like chicken and beef. And if chicken becomes more expensive, then some people are going to buy more beef instead. So an increase in the price of a substitute tends to lead to a higher level of demand. On the other hand, we have the issue of what are called complements. Complements are goods that complete each other, and you can see the word complete hidden in there. And two goods are complements if they are used together often. So an example might be something like, if gasoline prices fall, then people are going to drive more. If people drive more, then they're going to want to buy more tires. Because remember, a rightward shift of the demand curve means that at every price, we now have a higher quantity demanded. And we'll see an example of that in one of the next slides. If consumers expect prices to be higher in the future, they'll often want to buy today so that they can avoid having to pay that higher future price. Why have I said usually here? Well, some things you can't store. You can't sort of save up extra rent or extra acupuncture by getting a larger apartment today or getting lots of acupuncture today, and that'll help you when prices go up next year. So if we have a storable commodity, the expectation of higher future prices is likely to lead to an increase in demand. If we have something that's a non-storable service, then it becomes a little bit less clear. Higher future income. When people expect their income to go higher in the future, that often leads them to buy more today because they sort of go, well, I don't really need to save money or maybe I can even borrow money. This is again a usually because if we have something like an inferior good, then people aren't going to consume more today because they expect their income to be higher in the future. In fact, they would probably ex consume less today. This kind of effect is especially important for goods that people tend to finance, things like cars and houses and that sort of thing. For things like movie tickets, it's going to be less important. And then sort of last, we have a bunch of things that just directly influence demand. If something becomes more fashionable, then people want to buy more of it. If a firm runs an advertising campaign, then that will typically increase the demand for its product. And as it says here in the last line, if any of the above are reversed, then instead of people wanting to buy more at every price, people are going to want to buy less at every price. So let me go ahead and add to our little numerical example here. And we're going to add some additional buyers to the market. And you can see that sort of whereas there was just one low willingness to pay buyer before, now we have two low willingness to pay buyers. If there was just one moderately low willingness to pay, now we have two. So I've added an extra A, an extra B, an extra C, an extra D, and an extra E here. And if we were going to graph the new demand curve, instead of this original demand curve here with the squares, our new demand curve would be these triangles. And you can see that at every price, at least every price greater than 70, we now have a higher level of quantity demanded. 
because we have more potential buyers. And we would normally call the original demand curve D1 and the new demand curve D2. On the other hand, let's suppose that instead of just adding more people, we're now going to go ahead and make the good less appealing. So the fans, as it says here, they learn that the band will be lip syncing that night, which makes the concert half as appealing. And notice this idea of willingness to pay gives us a way to sort of measure imperfectly, but measure how much something is worth to people. So what I've done here is I've assumed that everyone's willingness to pay goes down to half of what it was a couple of slides back. And now our new demand curve would be this bunch of diamonds here. And you can see that when the good becomes less demanding, there's a lower quantity demanded at every price, which is the same as a leftward shift of the overall demand curve. So there are two review questions here, which you can go ahead and take on MyCR. And now we're going to go ahead and talk about supply next.